And just when you think that I couldn't come up with another chapter, here I am. So once again, I'm gonna have to give you a little preface. In my last video, I was saying, the stone tools that Neanderthals created proved them to be potentially less cognitively enhanced than Homo sapiens. However, if you've seen my last last video, which I shall put up here, you will see that that may in fact have been wrong. And in some ways we cannot view Neanderthals as less smart than us, we just have to view them as different. Now although the archaeology and physiology of the sapien brain, notably the larger cerebellum, does make our species seem, if anything, at least more socially adept than that of the Neanderthals, we cannot say that the archaeological findings can say yes or no, yes we were smarter than Neanderthals, or we were just very different, as I said. I'm just gonna be discussing what we found. Are we smarter or are we just different? Well, I guess you'll just have to find out, won't you? <laughs> Lucky you. So unfortunately for my poor darling Neanderthals, I have a chapter on the arguments that have been made against their mental capacity. Now there is a good argument that because our ancestor species of both us and Neanderthals was estimated to have been living at about 800,000 years ago and because there's evidence for both species once separated to have been creating art, music to an extent of their own volition, we have to question whether this species may have actually had the foundational thinkings or abilities for creativity, even pre a million years ago. Now obviously, as we know, archaeology is not always our friend, in the fact that it just doesn't present itself where you need it. Therefore we cannot really tell how the brain of this ancestor species progressed. In addition to that, Neanderthals were around for about 400,000 years. In comparison to our species, we are a little baby, so they had had a lot longer to neurologically adapt in correlation with what their external environment was doing. The climate, the landscapes they were in, the external pressures that forced evolution, essentially. So it's possible that just as we underwent neurological adaptations when we were in Africa and so on and so forth, Neanderthals were experiencing the very same thing, especially as they went into Europe and were forced to live in colder climes and most likely adapt their way of living. Therefore, their brains would have been forced to think more divergently as time went on. And therefore, I make an argument that the Victorian stereotype of the stupid Neanderthal is primarily what has given it such a bad rep as a species. It's only by doing new research that we can actually get rid of this stereotype and say, no, they were simply different and I think that's going to be the key word throughout this entire video. This may have also affected the biasness of who sites have been attributed to. There are some sites that potentially, previous to modern times, may be Neanderthal but may have had artefacts deemed too sophisticated to be created by Neanderthals that were wrongly attributed to us or were simply deemed as flukes. One such famous one, which I think I probably mentioned in a video about two years ago, was the DVA Baba Flute, which was found in Slovenia and essentially has holes that appear to be very well placed and can actually kind of be played to make different notes. And people have been saying, this is clearly a flute. This is clearly created by somebody, Neanderthals, to create music. Other people, however, have said no. No, no, no. Do not be so silly. This is simply the tooth marks of a big cat or something of that nature. Correction, it would have been a European hyena. This is simply two puncture holes that happen to be placed quite neatly and be quite rounded and have somehow haven't cracked the bone. I think this is wrong because if you have a big cat that crunches through a bone, more than likely it's literally going to go not just have two very nicely well-rounded holes and no other damage. So, you know, this is really up for debate. Now we're gonna take a quick skip, hop and jump to look at climatic effects during Homo sapien migration. Now, if we look at the fact that 
not of people decided that Neanderthals couldn't have made the archaeology that was found in caves of Iberia. There have been some new links made between the waves of migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa from 100,000 years ago onwards. And some people have actually hypothesised that humans, Homo sapiens, may have in fact reached Europe by 80,000 years ago. In which case, this would kind of mess up our idea of what was going on in Europe for a good 40,000 years. Now, these episodic migrationary waves supposedly happened 106,000 to 94,000 years ago, 89 to 73,000 years ago, 59 to 47,000 years ago, and 45 to 29,000 years ago. One of the major neurological modifications that happened within the Homo sapien brain appears to have coincided with climatic change 100,000 years ago. These were episodes of warming, which essentially led to green corridors, allowing Homo sapiens to either migrate up through the Sahara Desert to the Mediterranean or around to Arabia and the Red Sea kind of area. Now, there definitely, definitely is evidence for the famous exodus of people around 60,000 years ago, in which Homo sapiens would have followed the Indian Ocean Rim into South Asia and possibly then up north. Sorry about this really jarring segue. These sites include such places as Jebel Fayal, dating up to 125,000 years ago, which is really quite the surprise and would predate our earliest estimation of an African exodus. However, in another cave in the Levant, there's been evidence potentially dating back 50,000 years before that in Mislia Cave, which would really make things interesting for us. If we find that Homo sapiens have been roaming about in other places outside of Africa for much longer than we thought. Even if they either kind of died out in that area or went back to Africa, this is still clear evidence of people trying to make it out, out and venture forth into the rest of the unknown world. Now, all of these climatic changes are attributed to slight wobbles that happen naturally when the Earth is rotating on its axis, which leads to periods of slight heating or cooling, which gave our species the opportunity to dominate the world eventually. Now, to further back up the big, big brains of the Homo sapiens, researchers have claimed that it's most likely that we were able to reach Missoul Island in the north of Australia around 65,000 years ago using sea level mapping, least risk migration routes and line of sight sailing. Now to have reached Australia by this stage, people have to have left Africa millennia beforehand, which does really support the theory that people were leaving by at least 80,000 years ago. Possibly beforehand, most likely beforehand. So in a way this further backs up the theory that people could have been in Europe by 80,000 years ago, considering that it is considerably less of a distance to get to Europe from Africa than it is to get to Australia. Well, we're at a fresh new angle. Moving on to evidence of definitive Homo sapien produced work. A series talking partially about Homo sapien produced art would not be complete without a mention of Chauvet Cave. Now that is a cave in France, which is between 37 to 29,000 years old. It was discovered in 1994 and it holds some of the best preserved and quite sophisticated drawings of several things like European lions, bison, European rhinos, all the, all the, all the bloody extinct animals that we now no longer have here because we hunted them all to extinction. Now considering that those drawings were made by people who had no mirrors, no ability to take a photograph, and were only able to do such thing through the power of memory. It appears that maybe they have not really, we have not really had much of a neurological development since that time. And it also seems that that time was relatively warm, considering the fauna that was living in France, which was much like that of Africa. Additionally, people there clearly weren't just surviving, they were thriving if they had the time to make these pictures. They also may have had somewhat of a spiritual element to their lives because there was a kind of plinth, like a rock in the middle of the cave with a bear skull placed directly on it, just the bear skull, which really points to some kind of altar, sacrificial, I don't know, shrine. I mean, I know every single archeologist is like, oh, it's, it's a ritual, it's a ritual and sacrifice. Oh, oh, it must be ritual, but 
you know, it does look a bit odd. Like, why would you just leave that hanging about on the rock? And of course, we have to compare the art produced at sites such as Chauvet Cave with what we've seen of Neanderthals. Obviously, they didn't produce quite as much cave art, and that cave art wasn't to probably our standards of homo sapien art in terms of how realistic it looks, all the different types of pigments they used, and how extensive their portfolio is. Now moving on to the real question. Did homo sapiens teach Neanderthals the art of art history? Now obviously we have absolutely no recordings of communications between the two species. However, we do know that they must have been at least aware of each other's presence. As I mentioned in my last video, there was a cave in France which was occupied by Neanderthals, then Homo sapiens immediately after, and then Neanderthals immediately after that. So we have to assume that they bumped into each other at some point within that region. Additionally, as we all know, generally speaking, most people within Europe are 1-3% to Neanderthal. So we know there was interbreeding going on. What's more to say, really? And as already previously mentioned, we know that Neanderthals did have some desire to produce garments, some basic rudimentary jewellery, and some form of symbolic expression. However, unfortunately, biology just can't tell us that much. We do not know to what extent they came up with that by themselves, or were taught by Picasso himself. And to be honest, I think it is still this negative stereotype that we have of Neanderthals that is really permeating our view and even scientific findings in relation to their intelligence. And I don't think they get as much credit as they deserve. Clearly our species was heavily affected by the surrounding environment and we were able to evolve the psychological foundations needed to want to express symbolic imagery and creative desire. And we know that through other studies, even chimpanzees have some, I'm guessing, quite a high level of self-awareness. So to rank Neanderthals as potentially only at an intermediate level of intelligence between us and chimpanzees, I think is incorrect. I think it's biased. I think they're clever men and everyone should know it. So I think for the fact that we've seen how the environment can affect our brains, and how the environment therefore must have affected Neanderthal brains, especially when they began to migrate into new climates. I think we should be able to deduce that there was some element of divergent thinking present among Neanderthals, which would have led them most likely to want to create symbolic imagery, just like our species. And some favourable environmental conditions, i.e. the fluctuations of the Earth's climate, must have allowed that to happen. And that is my conclusion. No, I do actually have a conclusion but I'm going to probably put that in a very short, short video after this, the week after. Now that was incredibly rambly, but that's that basically. I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ta-ta.